Throughout human history, many curious mysteries and phenomena have prompted extensive research. The study into these strange subjects offers a window into the undiscovered ancient world and the questions surrounding their existence. Number 5 The pencil-sized discovery of what initially appeared to be a four-legged snake resulted in widespread scientific theories. This find may have shed light on an age-old debate arguing the question if modern-day snakes lost their limbs by aquatic evolution or by land. In the year 2015, an astonishing discovery had been reported by a team of paleontologists of a well-preserved creature within Cretaceous rock. The remains were that of a snake-like creature, harboring four fragile limbs. They had named the unidentified animal Tetrapodophus. The name Tetrapodophus was derived from the Greek word four-legged serpent. Previous fossils, which were said to have been proto-snakes, had only been equipped with one set of legs, which usually took the form of hind limbs. It was at first suspected to be the missing connection between snakes and lizards. The fossil was calculated to have dated back to around 120 million years ago, which would make it one of the earliest snake discoveries. Each of the almost vestigial legs were equipped with five toes. The remnants were said to have come from the Brazilian region, it was postulated that these creatures may have evolved from the southernmost part of the supercontinent of Pangaea in Gondwana. However, through further analysis, it was determined that this specific specimen may have come from the northeastern area of Brazil. One scientist studying this specimen was a vertebrate paleontologist, Nicholas Longrich, belonging to the University of Bath in the United Kingdom. He also co-authored the recent study on the creature. He stated that the animal's skull is the size of a human fingernail. It also consists of 160 spinal vertebrae and a tail consisting of 112 vertebrae. Before this analysis, the fossil remained in the privacy of a German museum where David Marthill, a student from the University of Portsmouth, came across the exhibition while on an educational field trip at the museum. In the German museum exhibit, no further information had been portrayed on whether or even when the specimen had been found. However, according to Longrich, based on the limestone features which encased the remains, along with the orange tone of the fossil, indicated that the fossil most likely came from the northeastern Brazilian area. He also furthered that these rock types could be found on the bottoms of lakes somewhere between 113 million and 126 million years prior. It's also been stated that the fossil may have been illegally transported from Brazil but it's unclear if this is the case given that no information on where the fossil was unearthed is available. According to research, the Tetrapodophus has many features in resemblance to modern-day snakes. Scientists also revealed that snakes are the only known reptiles with 150 vertebrae within their spine. The specimen in question was said to have sharp, curved teeth. Additionally, the impression reveals scales which run the length of the whole body, another quality which is unique to the modern serpent. The fact that the specimen has a rounded tail and reduced limbs speculated that snakes most likely evolved from burrowing animals instead of aquatic beings as previously believed. Although many scientists are on board with the speculation that the creature may be that of a prehistoric snake, some have differing opinions. One such person is Michael Caldwell, who is also a vertebrate paleontologist from the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. Caldwell had not seen the specimen in person and had only viewed it in photographs when he suggested that some of the features of the spinal vertebrae did not align with other serpents or lizards. He stated that the frontal area of snakes and lizards are concave, whereas the rear are convex, which he states does not seem to be the case with the tetrapodophus. A biology professor named Robert Rice also concluded that the creature was not a snake. Rice, as well as Caldwell, managed to secure access to the fossil and were able to study it further. Rice initially stated that the snake was actually just a tiny lizard. He later explained that the rock had been split upon extraction, which revealed the remains on the other side of the slab and stated that the study failed to see that the natural imprint was that of a lizard. Rice also referenced that the teeth of the specimen would allow for its prey to travel in one direction down the mouth. Rice and his team further analyzed the animal remains, and although they didn't believe that it was the remnants of a serpent, they still thought that it was an important find. During their investigation, they came to find that the anatomy seemed to be accordant with that of an extinct aquatic lizard from the Cretaceous period, 
known as the Dalekasaurus. Another observation made by Caldwell was that the last meal of the creature was that of a fish. This aligned with the idea that the specimen was of aquatic nature. However, the paleontologists who initially claimed that the remains were that of a prehistoric snake stood by their theory. The confirmation of either theory remains a future decision. Additionally, the Tetrapodophus is said to be the only four-legged snake remnants recorded. Another research found that the specimen was missing the zygosphenes and the zygantra which aid a snake in moving back and forth. However, with the addition of legs, would these stabilizing systems really be necessary? According to researcher Bruno Augusta from the Museum of Zoology at the University of Sao Paulo and the Southern Methodist University of Texas, says that the case of the Tetrapodophus is not open and shut. He stated that no reliable information came from the mold without the remnants of actual bone. It goes unknown if the modern-day snakes could have developed from an age-old land-burrowing creature with the addition of four limbs, which would be quite an unsettling thing to encounter in the modern age. Number 4. What seems to be a common occurrence throughout the vast landscapes of our planet is the presence of megalithic engineered stone artifacts. These creations often consist of some of the hardest types of stone, such as diorite and granite. And somehow each of these monolithic builds has been very precisely cut, shaped, and polished, as well as moved across immense amounts of land by an ancient civilization without the use of modern tools. Some explanations and theories have circulated regarding how these creations came to be, and how these societies were able to create them with such great precision. The earliest monuments discovered date back to a time when people may not have been able to read or write. However, the idea that these ancient societies were too primitive to be responsible for these incredible structures has been dismissed. Those who created and moved these immense structures were that of some of the most intelligent astronomers and mathematicians, without the aid of instruction manuals or any form of writing to dictate their work. These people must have had some sense of higher ability to be able to strategically construct these builds, but the question remains, how did they achieve this? Given the structure of some of these stone works, it seemed as though the ancient beings had come into the possession of some form of modern drill, which formed perfect holes and precise cuts. But what remains an even more important question is how these large builds were moved, how exactly they were cut and so perfectly placed. Another common baffling stone arrangement is that of the seemingly randomly placed stones placed in a rough circle somewhere in the middle of a field. It was said by Daniel Defoe in the 18th century that all he had learned from these strange arrangements was that there they are. Investigations of these sites have been carried out but often yield very little information. Beneath these circle stones lies nothing but bedrock and sediment. However, sometimes within these circles, there's an indication of cremation as well as charcoal remnants, which only speculate a ritual ceremony of sorts. But the unearthing of pottery fragments and some fire indicators does not answer the baffling questions which surround these ancient monoliths. It's been speculated that fire and electricity may have been discovered by these prehistoric societies, but were left undocumented due to a lack of reading and writing capabilities. These discoveries could have aided them in the creation of the monolithic structures. One such invention could have possibly been the Baghdad batteries. In 1938, a discovery was made of clay pots harboring copper cylinders. It was assumed that these items would have been used as galvanic cells, which convert free chemical energy into an electric current. It's speculated that these 2,000-year-old batteries predated the conception of cell batteries by more or less a thousand years. It's theorized that an invention such as these batteries may have been used in machining the mysterious stones by powering prehistoric drills or stone cutting tools. According to a professor of engineering science at the Oxford University, Dr. Alexander Tom, the stone circle of Kalanish aligned perfectly with the northern direction, which is supposedly a very difficult thing for anyone to achieve. From then on, Dr. Alexander spent most of his time in the fields of Britain studying these circles, and in 1967, he acquired the results of 600 sites, stating that all these circles had been geometrically constructed and aligned faultlessly with astronomical design. The common measurement unit was the megalithic yard, which measured 2.72 feet. Those who constructed these builds used the forms of ellipses, egg shapes, and flat circles, which all showed an indication of the right-angled triangle which had only been discovered a thousand years later. 
known to the school of Pythagoras. And like Pythagoras, within these constructs, there have been clear evidence of integral numbers used in triangle dimensioning, such as 5, 12, 13, and 8, 15, and 17, which also implied that the comprehension of the pi value had already been known before its recorded discovery two millennia later. Within large structures, such as Stonehenge, Karnak, and Avebury, perfect geometrical harmony is evident. Such as in Karnak, where the center forms a knee where the rows of stone change direction, which, according to Dr. Alexander, would require the use of two Pythagorean triangles. In his study, Dr. Alexander also found with the use of distinct materials, namely the stone markers and hill notches and constructed platforms, the society managed to turn the constructs into some form of observatories. These would have measured simple things such as midsummer and midwinter sunrises but also to a number of advanced movements which essentially needed an accuracy of one part in 1000. Alexander also discovered that these societies were able to ascertain a phenomenon known as Moon's Minor Standstill, which would require generations of study to be able to detect the tiny irregularities within the Moon's orbit. The work of C. A. Newham was able to confirm that Stonehenge was used for astronomical study. While standing in its center, one can see when the sun and moon would reach certain markers of the horizon, until reaching the orbit limit where a new cycle would start. And with this, the level of intelligence of the ancient people had been proven. More of the mysterious monoliths was that of the pyramids. The square base of the Great Pyramid aligns perfectly with north, east, south, and west. It remains controversial as to what the purpose of the pyramid was. One theory stated that the pyramids would have been the tombs of pharaohs. But the trouble with this was a lack of bodies found within. Even though coffins have been found inside the pyramids, they remained empty. Perhaps the use of these pyramids had been for something else entirely, such as astronomical study or something similar. It was even found that whoever built the Great Pyramid had knowledge of the circumference of the world and the length of the years, which was inclusive of the awkward 0 0.2422 day fraction. This also means that they may have known the length of the orbit around the sun, and possibly even the 26,000 year cycle of an equinox, gravity, or even the speed of light. It was also found that the achievements made by the ancient Egyptians were identical to that of the European megalithic engineers around the same time. Many years before the invention of books, writing, and documentation, it seems as though some scientific and astronomical discoveries had simultaneously been made in different areas of the world, such as the value of Pythagoras, calendars, true north-bearing compasses, and an accurate measurement system. The explanation behind how these immense monoliths came to be remains controversial and highly speculated. Some have even suggested that ancient civilizations played a role in these mathematical constructs and were not the work of primitive societies and advanced tools, but rather that of supreme beings. The clarification behind megalithic engineering remains unknown. Number 3. One of the great mysteries of the world and physics remains the existence of gravity. And according to the laws of gravity, what goes up must come down, or at least it should roll down, such as if we had to place a ball on a slope. Perhaps this is due to the force of gravity which attracts objects of mass. This idea of gravity has been defied by a mega boulder that can be found on the continent of India. On the coast of India, a gravity-defying boulder can be found. The rock, weighing at least 250 tons, stands on the slope of a hill with less than a four-foot base. This mysterious immense stone, known as the Stone of the Sky God, has been nicknamed Krishna's Butterball. The structure stands at a great height of 20 feet with an incredible width measuring 5 meters wide. Strangely, the placement of the rock looks as if it's about to roll down the slope, yet it remains unyielding in its position. The fixed rock is even able to withstand events such as tsunamis, cyclones, and earthquakes, which it had successfully done for over 1200 years. The nickname given to the rock derives from the religion of the god of Krishna. It stated that butter is his favorite dish and it's said to fall from the heavens. Additionally to this, a piece of rock has been sheared off and it's unclear as to what caused the corrosion. On the accounts of some geologists, the form of the rock was said to be unnatural and no natural erosion could have caused the odd shape. This theory, however, was discounted by scientists who believed that the stone was of a natural, regular form. 
Some theorized that the boulder was unmovable due to traction holding it in place, and the center of gravity provides equilibrium for the immense structure. There is a story told that in the year of 1908, for the fear that the stone might roll over the town, Othier Lawley attempted to move the boulder using seven elephants, yet it stayed in place. Krishna's Butterball is a famous tourist attraction where the people attempt to push the rock over before using it to shade themselves from the harsh sun after failing their attempts. Even though we now have the technology to shatter the rock entirely, it's been placed in protection as a national monument. The question still begs the scientific explanation for the balancing boulder. The boulder itself is of granite composition and it lies at a tilt of a 45 degree angle. No one is quite sure why the rock froze in that position upon its descent from the hilltop. It was theorized that perhaps the stone had been placed there by humans, but it's far too large to move without the help of tools or machinery. Even with today's modern advances in machinery, the massive rock would still prove difficult to move. There are numerous unanswered questions surrounding Krishna's butterball, such as what lies beneath it and how did it get there? Had it been pushed up the hill, and if so, why can it not be pushed back down? Some have even questioned if a higher level of ancient technology, possibly of alien origins, could have been used to move the boulder and place it on the slope, in an unmovable manner. Nevertheless, this strange phenomenon is purely of scientific explanation which has not been identified or uncovered just yet. Only unconfirmed theories guess at a plausible resolution. However, some discount these theories and rely solely on an explanation of physics. It was stated in this account that the idea of using elephants to move the boulder was pointless. It was said that the average Asian elephant weighs between 3 and 5 tons and could probably only lift about a ton or even half that. This meant that the 7 elephants would have only been able to push or pull about 3.5 tons or 7 tons at the most. In the following theory, it's assumed that the center of gravity of the rock is more or less 3 meters above the rock's middlemost region, 6 meters if the boulder had been in the shape of a sphere. With the base sizing at 1 meter, it was said that if the stone were to roll at a point half meter off of its incline, outside of its base it would perhaps be able to tumble. This basically means that the highest most part of the rock has to move about 1 meter from its original position to be able to offset its center of gravity allowing it to fall over. Even with some form of explanation as to how the rock has come to rest on the slope without rolling further, it still begs the question of how the rock got there. No records have surfaced indicating where exactly the boulder came from. Additionally, there are no carvings present on the colossal rock, which is inconsistent with the latter of the area, since most of the other rocks, stones or buildings have some form of ancient carvings. It was stated that this type of rock is known as Ventifact which meant that the stone had been sculpted by wind using small sand particles. The wind supposedly cut and polished the stone through abrasion and rather arid conditions. It's said that regions with high velocity and frequent sandy winds can produce such sculpted stones. Another speculation is that the boulder is a glacial erratic which became stranded on the hill. A glacial erratic refers to large chunks of rocks that are transported over long distances through moving glaciers. Krishna's butterball rests on its slope as a reminder that scientists and ourselves have not unlocked all understanding of the ancient world and scientific happenings, and our explanations for the world around us remain incomplete. The idea that some form of alien civilization could have been responsible for such a strange occurrence remains a haunting theory. Number 2 In an isolated region of northern Siberia, the valley of the Tunguska River was impacted by a devastating blast. On the 30th of June in 1908, at 7.17 am, an incredible fireball made contact with the earth, laying waste to an area of around 500,000 acres. The cataclysmic fireball melted down metal objects and burnt trees to ash. A distance away, some locals were lifted from the ground and had their tents carried away by strong winds which came from the impact. On the account of a farmer, he stated that he saw a flash of light which sent him flying off his porch and caused him to lose consciousness, and when he awoke, he was met with a noise shaking the house and it almost took it right off of its foundation. He also stated that it looked as if the sky had split in two. The explosion ranged at an altitude of 15,000 to 30,000 feet. It was estimated that the blast had the equivalent impact of 15 megatons of TNT. Shortly after, a cloud had formed over Europe 
Such clouds are the result of a sudden stream of ice crystals sent into the atmosphere, which is said to be what may occur after the vaporization of a comet. Some scientists support the theory that this impact was likely caused by a large meteoroid with a diameter of about 150 to 300 feet. It was speculated that the object in question had exploded within the atmosphere above Earth's surface and resulted in a fireball and blast wave which accounted for the fact that there was no crater created by the impact. The only remnants were that of small fragments. The astounding event was not investigated until 1921. A Soviet mineralogist by the name of Leonid Kulik found himself accidentally stumbling upon this occurrence and went to analyze the area in hopes of explaining what had happened. Leonid Kulik would only deploy an expedition to the area six years later and when he arrived on the scene, he stated, quote, the results of even a cursory examination exceeded all the tales of eyewitnesses and my wildest explanations. For the next two years, he had been in search of evidence to back up his claim that the cause of the impact had been due to a meteor of similar size to that of the meteor crater of Arizona. He had managed to unearth meteor dust as well as small craters, but none of these supported his hypothesis. According to eyewitness accounts from nearby towns, all described the object as a ball of fire with a trailing tail. It was reported that once the object made contact with the Earth, it appeared as a pillar of fire before being replaced by a smoky cloud rising from the ground. Witnesses who were closer to the scene had said that the ball was almost three times larger than the sun but not as bright. It was also recalled that the colors within the object varied from white, blue, and red and orange, much like the iridescence of a flame. Many different theories resulted in the wake of the devastating ordeal. It seemed as though whatever the object had been, it was not a meteorite as per Kulik's explanation. The controversial theories were split into what investigators said to be a comet and others claimed to be an otherworldly article. One such theory was adapted from the notion of black holes. In this speculation, it said that if the sun directly became a black hole, it would measure at 3 kilometers. Whereas if an asteroid, originally the size of 100 kilometers, were to become a black hole, then it would be the size of an atom. And if this had come into contact with Siberia, it would produce an atmospheric shock wave that was able to flatten many acres of forest and produce flashing and seismic effects. No crater of meteoritic proportions would occur with this idea. According to the theory, the black hole would follow straight through and re-emerge on the other side of the Earth a few moments later. But this hypothesis was debunked on the account that no explosion had been noted on the same day in the northern Atlantic region, which would have been where the black hole was to re-emerge, and such a theory would produce subterranean shockwaves, yet only surface shockwaves had been documented. A similar event did occur though, but only 105 years later, and it had been at a smaller scale. This event was known as the Chelyabinsk meteor, which proved essential evidence to the event at Tunguska. Don Yeomans, who worked at NASA at the time, also said that the reason that there was no crater after the disaster was that the supposed asteroid consumed itself, which resulted only in a really strong energy force and therefore not actually making contact with the ground. The next supposition was that of antimatter. This theory had problems early on due to the fact that the study of antimatter is still in its infancy stages. It also seemed improbable on the account that antimatter meteorites are said to form beyond the region of the Milky Way, meaning that they would lose their explosive abilities long before reaching the galaxy. Although the theory of antimatter has been used as a suggested solution for ball lightning, and with the study still being in its early stages, it's not quite been ruled out as a possible suspect. The extraterrestrial nuclear explosion comes in as the next speculation. The idea of alien involvement was initiated by the science fiction writings of a Russian man named Alexander Kazantsev. He was convinced that the explosion that impacted Tunguska had been the aftermath of a nuclear explosion within a spaceship. This had been used to explain the radial scorching of the forest with an undamaged center. It also fits well with the accounts of a pillar of fire and the dust cloud that followed, also accounting for the lack of a crater. The hypothesis was also used to give explanation as to why the object slowed down as it neared Earth. The cause behind these tragedies remains theoretical, many of which have been disputed, including the hypothetical ideas of UFOs, IFOs, antimatter, and a rogue comet, as well as a black hole and the presence of an extraterrestrial life force making contact with Earth. The strange occurrence is still thought to be a mystery, 
with the theory of a meteorite being disproved, not many other options remain. Number 1. We're often met with many strange phenomena that seem to regularly come from the sky. Another such occurrence is that of the ice blocks and creature storms which are somehow related. Ice blocks were first reportedly discovered by Dr. R. S. Griffiths. On the 2nd of April in 1973, the Lightning Observer for the Electrical Research Association in Britain observed a single flash of lightning which was said to be violent. He made note of the time that it occurred, the position, height, and weather conditions. After 9 minutes, a solid form of sorts made contact with the ground about 3 meters away. Upon closer inspection, Griffiths came to find that the object had been a block of ice which disintegrated shortly after. He grabbed the largest piece he could find and stored it in his freezer to be studied. This resulted in the prime study of a phenomenon which has still gone unexplained. The question was how could objects such as the ice block animate from a seemingly clear sky? Dr. Griffiths analyzed his collected sample which weighed 612 grams and was estimated to be a third of the original full-sized block, and numerous larger examples exist which have all reportedly exceeded the size of the largest hailstones, which seldom pass 200 grams. On the 9th of November 1950, it was reported that a farmer had experienced a storm of ice blocks the size of dinner plates, one of which weighed up to 7 kilograms. Griffith's finding was crucial for a number of reasons. In his accounts, he had shown that the structure of the block was different from any other recorded hailstone. Regarding the origins of the strange object, he concluded that it was made up of water from the clouds. According to British physicist Eric Crewe, the strike of lightning may have been associated with what occurred afterwards. Crewe theorized that lightning projects hot air which forms the basis for ice meteors as well as ball lightning. Some of the occurrences can be explained away by electrical, meteorological, and even aeronautical means while the rest just don't fit in with this basis. The Drexel Institute also formed their opinion stating that the ice chunks could not be of meteorological origin. They furthered this by explaining that atmospheric processes cannot form nor sustain these large objects. The University of Colorado gave input which said that these ice chunks could not have possibly survived the heat from the atmosphere and therefore could not have been derived from meteors. In the 19th century, a well-known study was carried out by C. Flammarion, known as the atmosphere, which told that during the reign of Charlemagne, an ice block had fallen with the measurement of 5 by 2 by 3 and a half meters. Another such account was noted in 1849 in Scotland of an ice chunk measuring 6 meters. More such accounts continued throughout the years, with the same repeated theory of the involvement of airplanes, which still goes unproven. These chunks of ice served as an introductory course to other strange objects that strangely fell from the sky. Science also fails to explain the cause of another sky phenomenon known as creature falls. Throughout recorded history, it's been reported infrequently that rains of mice, toads, worms, frogs, and even grain have made contact with the earth. It's been theorized that such occurrences have been caused by a whirlwind which transported these creatures elsewhere and deposited them like rain-like matter. One of the first records was that of the documented case in the 1st century AD where naturalist Pliny the Elder witnessed storms of fish and frogs. It seemed that most of the reports were that of aquatic animals. In the year 2005 in the northwest region of Serbia, a frog rain had been witnessed in a nearby town. Again in 2009, tadpoles had taken the place of rain in Japan, and in 2017, fish had been raining down in California, which occurred again in 2021 in the eastern side of Texas. These rains are said to be accompanied by strong winds, hail, and rain. Sometime in this year, it was also reported that worms had rained down in China. A village near Sri Lanka had made reports in 2014 of a fish species of tilapia that rained down but were still alive. The storm reportedly lasted for an hour. Even more eerie, in February of 2013, spiders had poured down in the town of Santo Antonio da Platina in southern Brazil. The cause of such an occurrence remains unclear but it did cause a mass panic and confusion among locals of the area. However, these accounts date back to ancient times. One of the more earlier accounts was that of the 14th of August 1894 in the city of Bath in England. Jellyfish had poured down from the sky. 
they littered the streets and gardens and even fell on pedestrians and roads. The cause of the jellyfish rain is still unknown. The theory of a water spout transporting these different animals just doesn't fit with the occurrences due to the fact that each instance has been a single species of animal at a time. It still remains a mystery as to where the immense quantity of these aeronautical creatures come from, and each account had shown a selection of a specific type of animal, some of which were lizards, snakes, mussels, fish, sprats, and sticklebacks, all of which lacked an obvious origin. Two separate accounts were reported in Hungary, the first of which was on the 18th of June in 2010. After hearing a loud sound, residents were flooded with a sudden influx of frogs. This happened again on June 20, 2010. These separate incidents remain a well-known frog raining occurrence. Another eerie incident in 2011 was the downpour of blackbirds in Arkansas, which had been identified as red-winged blackbirds, starlings, and cowbirds. The cause of this was left up to speculation. Theories that arose stated that this strange phenomenon had been that of water spouts or strong winds, but it's hard to believe that such natural disasters would specifically choose a single type of animal and transport the animal from an unknown origin. It's also noted that in many of these accounts, witnesses stated hearing a loud bang before the downpour would strike. Most of these reports had also been throughout the day. It can only be speculated that the loud bang was that of lightning before the rain began meaning that the strange creature falls may have had something to do with the large ice chunks that had fallen a few moments after a lightning strike. Additionally, it would be rather unnerving to find yourself rained on by strange creatures and arachnids out of nowhere, without warning, or have an immense chunk of ice break right next to you when you're least expecting it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.